Hey puzzle friends, how's it going? Welcome back or if you're new, I'm Juby and welcome to my channel. This is a place for anyone who loves puzzles, whether you're new to puzzling or you consider yourself an expert. Today we're doing a Q&A and I'm going to be answering all your questions. So thank you so much if you uh, sent me questions in the comments of the last YouTube video or if you sent them to me over on Instagram, there were some really great ones, lots of fun and interesting ones. So I'm looking forward to answering those for you. So yeah, I guess without delay, let's get into answering some questions. So I have quite a few questions here, which is awesome. And there's uh, most of them would be puzzle questions. So we'll do those ones first and then we'll get into some of the non puzzle questions. Um, so first up, we've got one that well, we've got a couple actually that sort of uh, similar. So I'll sort of kind of combine them. So uh, the first question is, when did you start puzzling and what kind did you do? And then someone else asked, what got you into puzzling? Um, so I was really into puzzling as a young kid, um, like probably younger than five. And I remember having a punky Brewster puzzle, which I absolutely loved. I think it was my favorite at the time, um, but there weren't any really specific brands that I was into or not that I can remember. I think I just did puzzles if they were given to me or if I went to a friend's house or a relative's house, we would just, if there's puzzles, we would just do them. So, but yeah, I always enjoyed them. And then sort of growing up like as a teenager and I guess in my more youthful years, um, I, you know, got some Ravensburger puzzles and a Clementoni, a Jumbo. And then um, I got really into reading Agatha Christie novels and then ended up getting like an Agatha Christie puzzle, like a mystery one and a couple other mystery ones. So, yeah, but then I sort of had a got really into puzzles more recently. Um, so at the start of 2020, I just sort of had an urge to, you know, do some puzzles that, you know, uh, that were different than what was in my collection. So I sort of looked online and was like really blown away by all these brands I'd never heard of and so many like cool designs. I think like a lot had sort of changed since I had last bought puzzles. Um, so I ended up buying a couple of uh, cobble hill puzzles that with cats on them and I really love them. And then just uh, it just kept going from there. And then of course, with the big sort of interest in puzzles that happened later in 2020, I sort of, you know, went along for the ride and uh, yeah, it turned into a full blown obsession and here we are today. So a couple of people also asked, uh, how many puzzles do you normally do every month? Um, it does sort of change month to month, um, depending how busy I am. And also I guess like the size of the puzzle and how difficult they are. But I would say that the minimum amount that I usually do is like maybe 10. So I think like last month I did 15. I can't remember, was it 13? I'm not sure. It was like more on the lower end. Um, but yeah, I'd say the, the lowest I do is 10. And then I think the highest I've done recently, because I only started sort of counting recently, was like 23. So I guess between like 10 and 20. But um, you, I can usually get, you know, close to 10, 1000 piece puzzles done. And then the rest are usually like smaller piece counts, like 500 pieces or 300 pieces. So it's a bit of a mix. Um, but yeah, I'd say, yeah, between 10 and 20. So the next question is also asked by a couple people and it is, what is your most favorite brand and what's your least favorite? Um, so I've actually got sort of multiple brands for each. So for least favorite, um, unfortunately I have to say Holdson, which is like a New Zealand brand. Um, I really love their images. They have beautiful like artwork and yes, they work with so many different artists, but unfortunately the piece quality um, is just really frustrating to work with. Like the pieces, pieces are so thin and flimsy and very glossy and they just do not hold together at all. The piece fit is so loose, like you could just whisper in their direction and your, your pieces will go flying. Um, and I'm a bit clumsy, so I'm prone to sort of bumping my puzzles, unfortunately, which means uh, very loose puzzles will, you know, end up in puzzle chaos. Um, and then probably another brand that I'm not so keen on is actually Seiko. I do have a, a few of them in my collection, um, but yeah, the ones I've done recently, again, like the pieces are pretty like soft and bendy, um, like flimsy, very glossy. They don't hold together very well. Lots of puzzle dust. Um, they do have really nice designs as well though. So I've sort of made a deal where I like them slightly better than Holson. So if I see a design that I really, really love and can't live without and the price is low enough, I will get it. But that's, you know, that's my rule. So. Yeah, I'm, I've sort of stopped myself from just kind of like buying them just because I just because I like it. So, yeah. Um, but as for favorite brands, that's hard because I have a lot of favorite brands, I guess. Um, and for different reasons, like I really like Art and Fable because they just so have such a beautiful 
uh, feel to the surface like it really is kind of a velvety silicony touch like it's very luxurious and they have uh, beautiful artworks on their puzzles um, also some other favorite brands are the soonness puzzles there's so many like uh, fun cute ones and especially the most recent like premium art puzzles they're very cool and I love that uh, she works with like a whole bunch of different artists and yeah so you just get some really cool puzzles puzzle designs and also the quality is really nice um, also, I love One But Many Puzzles, which is an Australian brand. They have beautiful quality and beautiful, like, uh, sort of Australian imagery, both like photography and I guess like uh, illustration or artwork. And uh, recently I discovered Tanya Weeks Puzzles, which is like uh, also, again, beautiful quality. And uh, she takes all the photos herself and they're just stunning and detailed. Um, I could go on. But yeah, they're probably some of my most favorite brands I'd say um, if I didn't mention any doesn't mean I don't like them it just means that's all I could think of for now but there really are like so many um, and then let's get on to our next question best budget and best splurge brands that was asked by uh, J Grogan 678 um, so with budget brands um, Hinkler definitely comes to mind so we have the brand Hinkler here which is sold in like discount bookstores and Kmart's are pretty easy to get and they're usually quite affordable and I would say like especially like their 1000 piece puzzles or even like 1500 piece ones the pieces aren't bad like are they the thickest most matte nice pieces no but for the price they're really reasonable um, you know I definitely think they're uh, nicer than Seiko and like Holdson and the pieces from, from my experience actually like hold together pretty well um, what else? Other budget brands? Um, well, I guess it sort of also depends where you are in the world. Like here I can get Treffle for a pretty reasonable price. Like they're more expensive than uh, Hinkler, but they are cheaper than Ravensburger or cheaper than like, uh, you know, Cobble Hill. So, and their pieces, they aren't my favorite, but they're reasonable. Um, they still feel like nice-ish quality. So I feel like, you know, Treffle isn't a bad brand either. And what else? Um, and yeah, I guess if you're in the US, like Buffalo Games, like here they're more expensive to get. Um, sometimes, depending if you can get them at, for a good price on Amazon, they're not bad. But I think in the US they can be quite uh, affordable, especially at like your Target or Walmart and even on Amazon, I guess. So yeah, I'd say like those three are some reasonable budget brands. But, you know, if you have any suggestions um, or budget brands you like please leave that in the comments below so everyone can you know find out about it and then splurge brands well some of the some of my favorite brands that I mentioned before are splurge brands for sure because they're definitely on the higher price points we've got like Art and Fable, um, One But Many, Tanya Wicks, um, what else? Uh, Water and Wines they're beautiful and expensive uh, oh the Soonness premium art puzzles are a bit of a splurge as well um, trying to think what else uh, yeah I guess yeah that, that's probably like oh it, I mean also again it depends where you are, where are in the world like sometimes here in Australia it's more expensive to get puzzles in um, and whereas like they might be more affordable somewhere else but yeah I guess off the top of my head they're probably the most splurge kind of brands but you know, uh, I still think they're definitely worth it. They're very nice. Um, so let's move on to the next question. So uh, Belinda S asks, what is your favorite puzzle snack and drink? So I actually did a video last year. I think it was like one of my first videos actually where I sort of talk about this, where it's like my top five favorite snacks. Um, I guess things have changed a little bit since then. So let's start with drink. Uh, that one's very, I guess, consistent is I pretty much always am drinking a can of Coke Zero or Coke No Sugar. Um, it's sort of my go-to. I kind of need to have one or two cans a day, otherwise I feel like I can't quite function, um, especially since I don't drink coffee. So that's my little mini caffeine hit. Or, you know, you might find me with a cup of tea um, and I always have a glass of water or mineral water. So that's sort of my drinks that I always have and especially while puzzling. And then as for snacks, I actually don't really snack as much as I used to. Um, I, I mean, I guess if I do snack, it's going to be stuff that's like the least messy possible. So something like, I don't know, 
like M&Ms or Maltesers or something like that, where it's not hard to like, you don't have to unwrap it and it's not going to like leave crumbs or sticky fingers. But I guess at the moment, yeah, I haven't really been snacking while puzzling. I think I just really, I find it too distracting. And sometimes I just want to like get in my puzzle zone. And whereas if I'm like snacking, I end up just eating all the snacks and not actually doing much puzzling. So, so yeah, that's where we're at today with our snacks and drinks. Um, so uh, Jeanette and her puzzles asks, how much time do you spend on average for a 1000 piece puzzle? So again, I feel like I'm terrible at answering um, averages. So um, I feel like I could spend anywhere from like four hours to like eight hours, but maybe my average is maybe like six or six-ish hours. I think again, it's, it's hard to say because even for a 1000 piece puzzle, it really depends on like how like what the images and how difficult it, difficult it is. Like I what recently did the sort of, what was it? 1,024 pieces or it was a square puzzle that was just over 1,000 pieces. The And I did a video on it, the uh, Magnolia Optical Illusion one. And that was, yeah, nearly one, about 1,000 pieces. And that took me like 14 hours or something like that, you know. But then I've done like the Gradient Crypt puzzle, which I guess is technically less than 1,000 pieces, but it was really quick to do. So, and other gradient puzzles have only taken like a few hours, if that. So, but yeah, I guess let's say six hours, maybe, maybe seven. I'm not sure. So Panda Puzzles asks, do you usually look at the box and, or do you think it's cheating? Um, so yes, I often look at the box lid, but I also sometimes don't because I just put it too far away from me and I, get lazy and can't be bothered picking it up all the time and I sometimes just literally forget to look at the box so but I'm not um, opposed to looking at the box lid um, and it also kind of depends on the puzzle I feel like if the puzzle is really detailed um, or very collagey then I kind of need to look at the lid or the reference poster a lot um, but if it's just sort of a I guess a general sort of image and you have a rough idea where things go or there's very clear colors or textures then I sometimes just don't bother looking at the lid very much or if at all and just kind of try and figure out where things go um, but yeah I get a bit lazy and I just can't be bothered picking up the lid half the time um, but as for do I think it's cheating um, well I think it's I mean it's really up to you I think you should just do puzzles however you like whatever makes you happy you know if you want to challenge yourself and do it without the lid or you're lazy like me and you can't be bothered picking up the lid then you know do it that way or if you feel like you need the lid or you just feel more comfortable puzzling that way I think go for it I think my only sort of exception would be um, maybe when you're doing like a crypt, crypt puzzle by Ravensburger uh, because like I guess not well kind of the lid or the back of the box has like the sort of like piece shapes like the whole image so I guess if you're looking at that, it's kind of cheating, maybe. So maybe that would be sort of uh, one circumstance where, yeah, maybe that's cheating. Um, but, you know, there's actually puzzles out there that, a, that are made specifically so you can't really cheat, I guess. Like, um, I think, is it different puzzles? Um, and some other brands where the image on the box lid is actually different to what you make. Or like, um, what's it called? was gidge is that how you say it that's a good example where what you get on the box is actually different than the end result so you can't really cheat and that kind of tests you in that way so yeah i feel like looking at the box lid is not cheating because if you like really want to do a puzzle where you can't look at the box lid there's some out there so yeah so piece by piece puzzler asks what do you do with your puzzles once you've completed them um, so I pretty much just take photos of them. I usually sort of take photos of the whole process from start, progress, and then the final images. And then I usually just pull it apart and pack it away. Um, I don't think I've like, apart from as like a teenager where someone convinced me like a relative glued a puzzle for me, I've never actually glued a puzzle or stuck a puzzle together. Um, so yeah, I just yeah put them away and then I either do them again later when I feel like it or sometimes I pass them on to someone else or donate them or sell them, that sort of thing. So yeah, um, yeah, I guess let me know in the comments below what you do. I think, you know, there's a lot of people who do glue them and then others like me who just pull them apart and pack them away straight away. 
So Janet Friesen asks, what's the difference between wooden puzzles and normal jigsaw puzzles and can you glue wooden puzzles? So I guess the main difference with the wooden puzzle versus like your regular puzzle is that the regular ones are usually made from some sort of cardboard and the, whereas the wooden ones are made from, yeah, some sort of wood, like a fiber board or yeah, I'm not really sure what a lot of them are made from, but, um, but it ends up being a lot thicker and sort of more chunky to sort of handle than like your sort of, I guess, regular cardboard puzzle. Um, and I guess another difference is that your, from what I understand, a lot of regular cardboard puzzles, the way they cut the pieces is they use like a giant, they call it like a die and it's sort of like a big, I guess like a cutting sort of mechanism that's like got almost like a mold, like it's a, a knife, but in the shape of all the, the puzzle pieces and it like comes down and cuts a whole bunch of like cardboard layers, which are all the different puzzles at once. So that's, I'm pretty sure that's how that works a lot of the time. Um, and so, I mean, not always, but sometimes you get a fairly snug fit. Um, but with a wooden puzzle, a lot of them are done by being cut by a laser or sometimes even hand cut with like a jigsaw. So yeah, um, so that's, I guess, another difference. But because of that, um, the fit of the pieces for a wooden puzzle tend to be a lot more sort of loose or jiggly. Um, whereas like, yeah, most, I guess, cardboard puzzles tend to but most, not all, but they tend to have a more tight or like snug fit. Um, and then as for gluing wooden puzzles, I actually don't know. I mean, I don't glue my normal puzzles, so I don't know too much about gluing puzzles. I mean, I guess maybe you could. It might be a bit tricky because the fit is a bit more loose and wiggly. It could be hard to try and uh, get your pieces exactly where you want when you glue them. And I guess you'd have to use some sort of wood glue. Um, I guess also they might not be so great for displaying because they're sort of thicker. They might, you probably can't frame them as easily. So yeah, I don't know. But if anyone knows or if anyone has ever glued a wooden puzzle, let us know in the comments below. And then Janet also asks, how do you glue puzzles without gluing your puzzle board? Which is actually a really good question because I have never really thought about that. But yeah, how do you? Um, so someone actually responded to her uh, in the YouTube comments and I'll just read what they wrote. So I think that was Jeanette and uh, she wrote uh, With a big plastic bag a used credit card and a bottle of cobble hill glue. It's really easy So I'm not sure if she means like you Put the puzzle itself like take it off the puzzle board and put it on the plastic like lay it lay plas Plastic over your table and do it that way. I'm not too sure because I've never done it um, but another thing she wrote writes is you could also use lots of masking tape on the back and that way you can have the possibility of taking it apart again. And I have seen that. So I think Karen Puzzles actually did a video on this where she, like how she tapes um, like her puzzle, especially when she does a big puzzle, how she tapes like the different segments together and then puts them back in the box. And that way she can like pick up like a whole section. So I guess you could do the same thing with like a normal 500 piece or 1000 piece puzzle. Um, so yeah, I guess uh, if, you have suggestions on how you can sort of glue puzzles without I guess getting them stuck to your puzzle board let us know in the comments below because I'd be really curious to know as well um, so yeah next up the one that puzzles asks how many puzzles do you currently have <sighs> a lot <laughs> so this is really really embarrassing um, I'm almost I, I think this has reached hoarder levels of puzzling at this point um, I did a quick very quick count before this and um, it was definitely over 600 and I decided not to include all the ones that I've been putting aside for my declutter video uh, just to make myself feel better so, so yes um, more than 600 so that's a lot um, and yes I do plan on doing a declutter video soon so keep an eye out for that and then um, the one that puzzles also asks do you ever get overwhelmed by how many puzzles you have like me sweating laughing face yes i feel overwhelmed just just thinking about it um i'm trying to avoid walking into my spare room because i'm confronted with piles of puzzles and i don't know where to put them all and i just bought a new puzzle shelf and it's already filled up and there's still piles of puzzles on the floor in the spare room so yes yes i do feel overwhelmed um but i try not to think about it so that's pretty much it for all the puzzle questions. So let's get into our other questions. So Vicky Makes and Builds asks, what camera do you use for your videos? 
So uh, at the moment, I'm filming this video with my smartphone, which is the iPhone uh, 13 Pro, which I actually just got recently, like a couple few months ago. Um, and before that, I was filming my videos with my really, really old iPhone uh, 8, I think it was. And it was definitely on its last legs and the battery was dying. And so I really needed to upgrade. So yeah, I'm glad I uh, went with this one. Uh, the quality seems really good and it's pretty easy to use. And um, yeah, I do all my time lapses with this as well. So yeah, definitely uh, have been enjoying using the iPhone 13 Pro. I think eventually I might change to getting like a sort of, I guess, dedicated camera for filming or maybe even a GoPro for time lapses or something like that, um, because it can get a little frustrating when, you know, I want to use my phone while doing a time lapse or I want to check something on my phone, but I can't because I'm filming with it. So like, I think normally you'd see people answering a Q&A using their phone because they're filming with a different camera, but no, I'm using my laptop. Um, yeah. So next up, Jay Grogan 678 asks, uh, has your channel changed your daily life in any way? And yeah, I guess it has. So on a sort of, I guess, less important way, um, I find myself, I guess, logging into the YouTube studio and sort of just checking how my videos are doing every day and just uh, looking at comments and re responding to those. But I guess like on a deeper level, I've definitely formed some really good connections with people. So both like in the comments and over on Instagram, I've like, you know, been making friends with like different puzzles out there from all around the world, which is really cool. It's always nice to like talk to like all sorts of puzzle people and get their perspective on things and just, yeah, and have fun chatting about puzzles. And I've also, you know, made friends with other puzzlers who have YouTube channels as well. So I think that's really cool. We're kind of like a little, I guess, mini puzzle YouTube community. And yeah, maybe we can even do some collaborations in the future. I think that would be fun. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Um, so the next question, uh, Tanya Weeks Puzzles asks, do you have a day job and any other hobbies or interests? So at the moment I work as a freelance graphic designer and web designer. So yeah, just uh, doing odd jobs here and there. Um, before that I was actually studying uh, Japanese studies at university. Um, and then before that I was working full time as a graphic designer and kind of web designer, but mostly graphic design, doing magazines and digital things. Um, but yeah, since the big disruption we've been having over the last couple of years, yeah, I've just kind of been doing like freelance stuff and um, you know, it's been a bit tough because uh, originally after finishing my university degree, which is like, you know, in Japanese, um, I was hoping that I, you know, might be doing some work in Japan or tourist kind of, like tourism kind of work. But uh, yeah, that, that didn't happen for obvious reasons. Um, and uh, unfortunately, Japan is still fairly closed to people. So it's a bit tough to try and go there or do tourism kind of stuff. We don't have a lot of we don't really have many tourists coming to Australia from Japan either. So yeah, so I think it's a bit of a waiting game at the moment and we'll just sort of see where things take us. Um, but yeah, at the moment I am enjoying having a lot of extra time for puzzling. So that's been great. Um, and yeah, do I have any other hobbies or interests? So yes, um, I really enjoy reading. Um, I read all sorts of stuff, but I do like reading a lot of true crime and I also like watching a lot of true crime and listening to true crime podcasts. So I guess, yeah, I'm into that sort of true crime uh, genre. But um, I also really enjoy watching RuPaul's Drag Race. So I, you know, recently finished watching uh, All Stars 7 and now I'm watching Canada's Drag Race. And also there's the uh, Australia and New Zealand one called Drag Race Down Under. So if you're a Drag Race fan, uh, let's chat in the comments below. Um, but yeah, I guess they're my main interests. So yeah, reading, listening to podcasts, watching different shows on Netflix and other channels. So yeah. Uh, Donna Puzzles asks, your dresses are beautiful. Where do you get them? Thank you very much. Um, I really like fun, uh, I guess not that colorful today, but fun and interesting things. And uh, well, this shirt and a lot of my outfits come from a store called Dangerfield, which I think is both here in Australia and in New Zealand. I don't think it's anywhere else. Um, so I get a lot of my stuff from there because they just always have really fun and alternative and just cool designs. 
And I also get a fair few things from Black Milk Clothing, which is an Australian brand, but I think they do ship overseas too. But yeah, they are, they're a bit more of a splurge, but they do have some really cool stuff. Um, so yeah, I guess that's where I get most of my things from. So Piece by Piece Puzzler asks, can you tell us about your tattoos and their significance to you? Um, so basically all my tattoos uh, don't really have much significance at all. I just like things that look nice or yeah, that just appeal to me. I don't really have any deep meaning to any of my tattoos actually. And the way I usually choose my tattoos is I, an idea pops into my head and I just sort of sit on that idea for like six months or it might be an idea or a theme or an image, something like that. Let that sit for six months and if I'm still really keen on that uh, after that time, then I'll like uh, actually research different tattoo artists and see, you know, find an artist whose style uh, kind of works with my idea and kind of collaborate with them and let them sort of take the lead and make it into like what works for them but is still like incorporating my idea so yeah that's what i've pretty much done for most of my tattoos i think the exception is this little lucky cat here which was like a tattoo flash day at one of the tattoo studios that i've been to before where they just have a sheet of different cute artwork and you just go in and pick one so there's probably someone else out there with this one too but um but apart from that all the others are just ones that i've sort of come up with that i liked the idea of and then got a artists to kind of match and do it for me so yeah we've got the nyan cat or nyan cat which is just a dumb internet thing because i like dumb cats and dumb internet things and it's cute and colorful and then um, i've got a chess piece here which is like uh, flowers and hummingbirds and like a gem in the middle and it's just a very i guess intricate and pretty and colorful design that just sort of came to me and then um, this sleeve here, which actually goes up to my shoulder, so you don't really get to see that. Um, it's like a hot pink coloured kraken or giant squid wearing like a steampunk helmet. And then it's sort of also got these like almost Japanese inspired like tattoo waves in it, um, but a bit more colourful than a lot of the traditional kind of Japanese tattoos. And then, yeah, the uh, kraken is holding different things like a giant gem and an anchor and I think a harpoon and different things with its tentacles so yeah and I do have a few others on my legs and like on the back of my neck as well but yeah none of them um, have any deep meaning they're just things I felt like getting so I guess yeah they're kind of just stuff I like and then piece by piece puzzler also asks um, I'd love to know about your wallpaper and pineapple background um, so as you can probably tell I like bright colorful quirky things and um, yeah, I just chose this wallpaper because I quite like uh, sort of mid-century modern style design, both like in graphic design and furnishing. So I guess this sideboard behind me here is a little bit reminiscent or inspired by that. Maybe it's a bit more modern, but it sort of has that feel to me. And then um, this wallpaper has all different like very 50s, 60s, I guess, mid-century modern um, lampshades or light fittings. And so... It's a bit of a quirky design and I just I wanted to put something colorful and interesting behind like behind me or on this wall um, and yeah that like I, that one caught my eye and I just kind of like the really bright sort of lime greeny chartreuse color um, I have another wall opposite me which you can't see which is that same color but just just paint um, to kind of match um, yeah so I actually had that for a while and yeah I just like that sort of I guess time period in design and then I guess that's with the pineapple I don't know it just sort of felt like it kind of fit in there with all the weird quirkiness and kind of like pineapples and yeah I just I don't know just like it thought it was cool um, so yeah and then we're at our very last question which I think might be one of the most important questions uh, the puzzling ace asks what nicknames do your cats have so Misty who you have seen in probably quite a few videos um, she has a few nicknames so um, stinky sometimes she gets called that because yeah she's a bit stinky sometimes um, but some of her probably nicer names are Misty Mayhem Misty Meow Meow Squeaky Misty um, I don't know I feel like I'm always making up new ones every day um, yeah probably Misty Mayhem is a good one because she's you know pretty chaotic and 
gets up to all sorts of mischief, misty mischief, um, tends to rip the carpet and the couch. She has plenty of scratching posts, but she uses those and the bed and the carpet and the couch and the cushions and me. So she's a bit naughty. <laughs> um, and then Rogue, who I don't know, you might have, if you follow me on Instagram, you might have seen Rogue, who's orange and ginger kitty and with a white belly. You might have seen her on some of my um, photos, but I don't think she's been in any videos. Mostly because she's right now sleeping and doesn't want to be disturbed and she's old and sleepy and lazy and doesn't want to be in any videos. Anyway, so I guess her nicknames are Rogi, Rogi Guts. Um, yeah, I guess she doesn't have as many nicknames as Misty does. Um, Rogarino. Yeah, usually just Rogi. That's probably what I usually call her. So that brings us to the end of the Q&A. And yeah, I really had a lot of fun answering all of your questions. Thank you again for sending those to me. Um, and I guess in the comments below, uh, I guess let me know what you thought of this video. Did you enjoy the Q&A? And I guess if you've got any other questions for me, feel free to pop those in the comments too, and I'll do my best to answer them. If you enjoyed this video, then make sure you show that like button some love. And for more videos like this and for even more puzzle content, then don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications. By subscribing, not only will you be the first to know when a new video is released, but you're also helping this channel grow. And you can find me over on Instagram at jigsaw underscore where you'll find even more puzzle content. Thanks so much and see you next time. Bye.